This is the 2022 Ontario Winter Bible School. Our speaker for the first session is our brother Tim Stiles from Okanagan, BC. His theme for this week is Josiah. He turned with all his heart. This is his first class, and the subject for this class is the early years. Our reading was taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 1 through 7. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Great, thank you. Let's see if we can keep that energy up throughout the week. Chaos. Chaos and tumult. That's the backdrop against which an eight-year-old in the divine wisdom of God is thrust onto the throne in Judah. His father has just been assassinated, and by all accounts, it was no tragedy because he was assassinated by his own servants. And then the people of the land rose up in response to that and assassinated those servants. And in these tumultuous circumstances, the record of Josiah's kingship begins. But we actually have to go back hundreds of years to see where the story of Josiah's life really begins. We need to turn back almost 300 years to 1 Kings chapter 13 to see where this all really started. If you think in your minds, brothers and sisters, there is no other king in Israel or Judah who had their birth and their life's work prophesied to the extent that Josiah did. And the circumstances around this prophecy that we'll look at for just a few minutes in 1 Kings 13 to set the scene, they add tremendous weight, but also no small amount of pressure to the importance of his kingship and what God desired of him. Recall that here in 1 Kings 13, the kingdom has only just recently been divided after the foolish decision of Rehoboam led to an uprising that resulted in Jeroboam being crowned king of the northern ten tribes. And Jeroboam has just finished setting up this alternative form of worship at the end of 1 Kings chapter 12. Perhaps you have some of this colored. At the end of 1 Kings 12, it's all about what Jeroboam established, that he made two calves of gold and he made a house of high places. He made priests of the lowest of the people, and he ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like to the feast that's in Judah. He offered on the altars. This is what he did, he did, he did, and he made, he made, he made. This is a religion that is oh so convenient, a religion that set about to completely and totally rival what David and Solomon had so carefully and meticulously set up and passed down to Rehoboam. But what we want to notice here in this last few verses of 1 Kings chapter 12 is where did all of this start? Well, the record told us twice in verse 26 and in verse 33. It says in verse 26 that Jeroboam said in his heart. And then the other book end at the end of Verse 33, it tells us that he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. This all started in Jeroboam's heart, a heart that is full of defiance, a heart that is full of self-interest. This is a man who, as we just saw at the end of 1 Kings 12, everything that he made, he made, he made. And what was God's estimation? He made Israel to sin. Isn't that so fitting, brothers and sisters? Because when we set that in the context of the early kings of this young nation, a clear pattern emerges. Because Israel's first king was a man of whom it said that God gave him another heart in 1 Samuel 10, verse 9. And when Saul eventually was rejected as king, Samuel told Saul, you remember those words, without even naming David, he tells Saul that what God is interested in is 
a man after his own heart, which David was. And for David's son Solomon, what did God warn would be the result if he pursued the women of the nations? 1 Kings 11, verse 2, they would turn away his heart. And what happened in verse 3? That's exactly what happened. His wives turned away his heart. Verse 4, they turned away his heart. His heart was not perfect with Yahweh his God, as was the heart of his father David. Verse 9, his heart was turned away from Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, the early history of the kings of Israel and Judah is not just a story of gods and priests and altars and kings. This is a divine battle for the heart. And that's what it's always been about. That's what it's still about today, isn't it? The record in, in 1 Kings 13, which we've turned back to, it reads as though Jeroboam has just finished setting up his rival system of worship. And behold, a man of God comes from none other than Judah to the very seat of this apostasy and sin that Jeroboam is about to inaugurate. You see it there in 1 Kings 13, verse 1. Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And it ties us right back to the end of chapter 12. At the end of verse 33, that's how chapter 12 concluded. It's a continuation of the record. And in fact, Rotherham's translation puts it this way. It says, the man of God came as Jeroboam was standing by the altar. Can't you just picture that scene, brothers and sisters? He's there. He's just about to inaugurate things. And who bursts onto the scene and cries out against the altar, not even against Jeroboam himself. It's as though he is decrying against the system that Jeroboam has set up in verses two and three. O altar, altar, thus saith Yahweh, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. What a testimony to a system that hasn't even been inaugurated yet. And you remember, brothers and sisters, how the events unfold. Jeremiah puts out his hand, sees him, and just as he does that, his hand withers up, the altar is rent, and the ashes pour out, just as the man of God prophesied would happen. And Jeroboam has to plead with the man of God to ask Yahweh to restore his hand, which in his mercy he does. But what's remarkable, remarkable about this story, brothers and sisters, is that context, that Jeroboam has created these abominations that would forever steer Israel away from God. And immediately, God says, I have the solution. But it's not the next king. It's not the next prophet. In fact, it's not the one after that, or the one after that, or the one after that. It would be 15 kings, and over 300 years later, that God would begin to undo all of the evils of Jeroboam by a man with a very different heart, a man from the house of David, because what began in Jeroboam's evil heart would be undone by what Huldah will refer to as Josiah's tender heart. And doesn't this actually take us back, brothers and sisters, as so many things do, just as a quick aside, to Genesis, the early chapters of Genesis, that just as sin enters the world, God says, I have a solution. But it will be hundreds of years before that solution becomes apparent. And that's both sobering and encouraging, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It's, it's sobering because sometimes the choices of one person, like Jeroboam, can have very far-reaching and very long-lasting impacts. Sin is destructive, not just in our own lives, but it can have ripple effects through so many others as well. Bad choices can wreak havoc on our families, on our ecclesias, on our CYC. Look what Jeroboam's actions did to Israel. We know what their history was like and what God eventually had to do with most of the 10, the ten tribes. But it's also encouraging, brothers and sisters. It's tremendously encouraging because we have to remember that when things look very bleak, 
when they looked like they couldn't be any worse and circumstances looked totally hopeless, God has the solution. And he's had the solution from day one, perhaps even before day one, for whatever situation looks so spiritually dire to us. Sometimes we have to wait a long time for that solution. But his hand is at work all along. Which of us, brothers and sisters, have waited over 300 years? I haven't. And I, by the looks of you, neither have you. But sometimes that's God's timetable. He sends the right person, the right thing, at the right time. But can't you just imagine Jeroboam, who now knows the name, the very name of the person who is going to come and supposedly undo all of what he has just set up. Can't you just imagine, Jeroboam? Because the prophet didn't say, oh, it'll be 300 years later, by the, by the way. I can just imagine Jeroboam scouring the land of Israel and Judah, sending out his little minions all the time. Is there anybody named Josiah? Just let me know. Let me know about the babies born named Josiah. And yet in God's wisdom, the two would never cross paths, not even by centuries. So now as we fast forward back to 2 Chronicles 34 that we had as our reading, all those years of ups and downs in Judah and all the downs, of course, in Israel, we come to 2 Chronicles 34 when Josiah is finally born. And we're not going to spend much time looking at his family background, but just recall that Josiah's father, Ammon, had been evil through and through. He had taken all the wickedness of the early years of his father, Manasseh, after Manasseh had repented and tried to undo all of that wickedness. Ammon brought them all right back into the open again. He promoted the evils of Manasseh's early years and encouraged everyone else to bring it right back into their homes. Second Chronicles 33 at verse 15, if you just glance back the page, it tells us that Manasseh cast those things out of the city, is what it says at the end of the verse. He cast them out of the city. And when Ammon takes the throne, what do we find in verse 22? He's sacrificing to the very things that Manasseh had made. So if this is what Josiah's dad was like, well, then how did Josiah turn out the way he did? Because we know how Josiah turned out. How did he turn out so good in light of such an evil father? Any thoughts? This is where I'm going to put your brain to work. I know you, you have some of these in your head, so let's spit them out. His mom. His mom, okay. As with many of the kings, when it, it lists their mom, we know that the mother had a tremendous influence spiritually on the son. Now, unfortunately, there's also some great counterexamples to that where the mother is listed and she was horrible. But I think Brother Joe is right that his mother perhaps had a great influence on him. Any other thoughts, Brother Chris? Is your repented grandfather of Manasseh? Yeah, so Manasseh was actually alive for six years when just after Josiah was born. Josiah was six years old. And now you might think, well, you look at a little six-year-old running around. Those of you who are parents know this to be true. Until you have a six-year-old, you don't realize how much influence you can, you can shove into a six-year-old brain. So Manasseh's example would have had a tremendous impact. I picture him as, as Grandpa Manasseh sitting there telling Josiah these stories that Manasseh in his mind is thinking, he's not going to remember all of this, but he's going to remember some of it. And even the church today says, give me a child. And they say, give me a child till seven. And I have him for life. So it's, it's well documented, even in psychology, that those early years largely chart the course for the whole life. Any other thoughts on, on how Josiah turned out so good? His peers. his peers. Yeah, we'll call that his support network. I think that had a huge impact on him. God surrounded him, and we're going to look at this a little bit more in tomorrow's class. God surrounded him in his, his early years with this incredible support network, just like he had for King Joash many years before. It's a great lesson, brothers and sisters, especially um, particularly for the young people, which we'll talk about with the young people in their classes, that regardless of what our family circumstances are growing up, God is so much bigger than that. He's so much bigger than our immediate circumstances. God uses other people in Josiah's life 
to get him through what he was no doubt faced with as a very difficult childhood during Ammon's reign. And God brought him through that. Sometimes the people in our lives who have the most impact on us will be our parents, but sometimes, sometimes they won't. Maybe it'll be a friend in the truth. Maybe it'll be someone else in the ecclesia. Maybe it's someone else's grandparent. Maybe you, maybe you are that for someone else's child. It's, it's sobering to think about brothers and sisters. For, for Sister Hadassah, it was a counselor at kids camp. It, it completely transformed her life. Had a, a huge spiritual impact on her. But God will provide them for each of us. And it's worth just reflecting on the fact that not only do we need those people, but we need to be those people in, in the times when God calls us to that. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in our study tomorrow, God willing. But it starts at a young age. Josiah is at the ripe old age of eight years old. Before his ninth birthday even happens, God has him on the throne of Judah. I wonder if we would be prepared to accept that as God's will if the prophet burst in here today and said, the eight-year-old in the class downstairs has some things to say to the ecclesia. I wouldn't suggest that Josiah actually did that at eight years old. We'll see that as we progress this morning. But, but that's the state of the nation. That's the wisdom of God. He was okay with that. In fact, he wanted it to be that way. But the work didn't begin immediately. There, there's more preparation to do. He's got to incubate in this spiritual environment before God's great work with him would actually commence. So it's not as though he took the throne at eight, as our eight-year-old used to like to remind us, well, Josiah was a king at eight. Obey your father and mother, son. <laughs> In fact, it wasn't until Josiah had been on the throne, as Brother Chris read, for eight years. So he's 16 now. And he makes this personal decision to seek after the God of his father, David, as it says in verse 3. And that the, the idea of seeking there is an interesting one. Um, anyone have any uh, note in their margin of what that word means? It's a neat little word. It means to tread or to frequent or to resort to. Now, I realize um, some of you probably know Hebrew better than I do, and there are perils in just relying entirely on what Strong says. But if you look at the way the word is used elsewhere, um, and you look at some other Hebrew lex lexicographers, um, the scholars tell me that that is that's a pretty good summary of what the word means. And it, it provides a neat little insight then, doesn't it? Because what happens when you tread the same route frequently through a field? Now, those of us that live in the city probably don't tread paths through fields. And driving on the same route to work every day isn't going to have quite the same effect that we're going to talk about here. But when you tread the same path through a field, you make a path, right? Where, where a path didn't used to exist, it now exists. It's a great analogy of what it's like when someone starts to seek God. It doesn't happen overnight. Nobody wakes up one day and says, I want to be baptized today. If they've never been exposed over slow periods of time to the still small voice of the word and attended things like Sunday schools and CYC and, and, and reading God's word on a daily basis. But it doesn't matter how old you are because treading a path to God isn't just something that's for kids and teens. Seeking God is the same process at any age. The consistent treading frequently as we read and pray and meditate on the word. That's how we develop a habit, isn't it? Isn't it? Consistency, repetition, consistency, repetition. And, and sometimes it feels like the same process, especially for those of you that have been in the truth many more years than I, it can feel like the same process starts to become a little bit too much routine or, or too repetitive. I, I've read the Bible enough now, so I'm gonna start looking at other books because, well, this path is too familiar. In fact, this path is a little, a little boring now for my flesh. I've frequented this path enough. But what happens when you abandon a path for long enough? The path goes away. It gets overgrown by other things, doesn't it? It takes hardly any time at all. And whatever other path we try to pursue will actually 
Well, we find that it actually doesn't get us to where we were trying to go. And discipleship in the truth is just like that. You have to keep seeking, keep walking, keep resorting back to God. In fact, that's that's what Asa was told, wasn't it? In 2 Chronicles 15, verse 2, that Yahweh is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, you will find him. You tread the path long enough, often enough, frequently enough, you will find him. It's, it's a great cross-reference to that idea of seeking after the God of David, his father, that Josiah did. But the great thing is, like, like when we go for a hike, well, I don't know how you hike, but where we hike in BC, you don't hike alone because there's wild animals. And God hasn't left us to, to frequent the path alone, has he? We have, we have what we might call role models to inspire us. Some brothers call these Bible heroes or, or Bible role models. It's actually a biblical principle to do that, isn't it? God himself says that the people that we read about in the scriptures are given to us. These things were written for our examples so that we might live like they lived, learn to think like they thought and act like they acted. So that we don't just read about Josiah, but we try to put ourselves in his circumstance to, to get into the way he's thinking, even though God hasn't always told us how he's thinking. And Josiah is no exception. He had role models, I think, that inspired him. Any thoughts on who Josiah's role model might have been? Put yourself in his shoes. Think about the people that he would have known of or read of. Who might have Josiah's role model been? There's no wrong answer here because you could say anything and I'll probably just accept it. Unless you say Jeroboam. <laughs> Any thoughts? Ethan? David. Yeah, I think it's, have you heard that? Have I talked about this before? I think it was David. And, and it could have been several people. I think in, to some extent he would have, as he grew older, he would have said, yeah, I want to be more like Grandpa Manasseh. But I think there are some hints in the record that David was one of his primary role models. Well, Keep in mind that Josiah, all, all he had was the book of the law, but he didn't have it yet. So he couldn't read of, of the Moseses and the Aaron's and the Miriam's and the Joshua and Caleb's and Aaron and his sons. He probably heard those stories from the faithful support network that God surrounded him with, but that record was largely lost at this stage in Josiah's reign. But what he did have more readily available was the more recent history, the chronology of the kings. And I think he grew up with a father like Ammon and turned out to be the man that he did because, well, when Ammon's your dad, you make someone else your role model because you have to. And I think... I think that was David. We're going to see as we go through the life of Josiah that he looked back at faithful men before him and said, I want to be like that because that's a spiritual quality that God loves. And I don't want to be like that at all because I'm pretty sure that that's a quality that God hates. Who did it say that Josiah in verse 3 began to seek after? It says he began to seek after the God of his father, David. Now, if that were the only clue in the record as to who Josiah's role model was, I admit that would be entirely unconvincing. But you remember the words of the man of God that we looked at just briefly. I didn't tell you to watch for them, but in 1 Kings 13, what did it say? It said, a child shall be born unto the house of David. So hundreds of years before his birth, Josiah is already described as coming from the house of of David. Now, again, if that were our only connection, it would still be unconvincing. I'm not going to give you the rest of them right now. We're going to look for them as we go through our studies this week, and then at the end, we'll identify all of them together, God willing. But I think David, uh, Josiah looked back at David and said, I'm going to cling to the example of my father, David, a man after God's own heart, and I'm going to have a heart very different than Jeroboam's, whose heart I was sent to overturn. So there's our clue for something to watch for as we continue through our studies this week. But I think Josiah did also have whatever you call the opposite of a role. What do we, what do you call the opposite of a role model? Is there a word for that? Like an anti-role model? <laughs> Sorry, anti-role model? <laughs> anti-role model doesn't sound very good if we're talking about a bad role model. I think Josiah looked at Jeroboam 
and said, I want to be everything the opposite of what Jeroboam was. I want to do the opposite of what Jeroboam did. I want to think the opposite of Jeroboam. If, if he didn't do it, I want to do it. If he did do it, I want to not do it. Because Jeroboam was condemned by the people, by the prophet Ahijah in 1 Kings 14 for not keeping God's commandments, for not following with all his heart, for making other gods and molten images, and for casting God behind his back. Those are the words of the prophet Ahijah in 1 Kings 14. And Josiah's life's mission, as we'll see, well, Josiah's life's mission was to carefully keep and do what the law instructed, to do it with all his heart, to reverse and destroy everything Jeroboam had set up and to keep God right in front of the nation and himself at every step. Who is your role, role model, brothers and sisters? It doesn't have to be just one and they don't even have to be alive. As we said, we're gonna see that Josiah had several examples, I think, who clearly he tried to follow. And it's worthwhile, it's scriptural to try to follow a role model in our lives. And it doesn't even just have to be the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be careful that we don't fall into the comparison trap so that we're, we're not trying to be a, a follow the example of another brother and sister. And then we find that we're actually comparing ourselves to them and, and becoming disgruntled with the fact that we're not more like them or that our, our marriage isn't more like their marriage or that my discipleship isn't like their discipleship or that my job is not as easy as that. that that's the comparison trap. But it's, it's actually scriptural to have someone that we, we can see in the ecclesia or several people and aspire to be like them in the way that they are like God. Because that's what Paul says, isn't it? He says to the Corinthians, follow me even as I follow Christ. Because when we're following someone else's good example and their behavior is Christ-like, then it's actually not them we're following at all, is it? It's Christ himself. And from a young boy, Josiah had to make difficult decisions like that. He had to make difficult choices about who he's going to follow, what choices he's going to make. Put yourself in Josiah's shoes. He knew, he knew from 1 Kings 13 that he was born to a purpose, but that didn't make him a robot. It's not like God created this pre-programmed boy and attached some strings to him and then held him up here and said, okay, this is where you're going to go now. And this is what I want you to do today. And Next year, we're going to do this. That's not how it works, is it? That's not life and the truth. Josiah had to make the choice at eight years old. Josiah had to make the choice at 16 years old what direction he wanted his life to go in. And it makes his example that much more powerful, especially for, for young people, but also at any age. There's a lot that we learn and a lot of growth that we experience when we can bear the yoke in our youth. And the reason this is such a powerful example, even for those that are much more advanced in years in the ecclesia is because we can't ask the young people to get involved in the CYC and get involved in ecclesial life and, and, and throw yourself into ecclesial work if we don't give them the opportunity to do that, right? We have to make the opportunities for the young people to get involved, give them opportunities to do things that perhaps somebody else could do better in the ecclesia, but they'll never learn how to do it if, if they aren't given the opportunity. I can remember the first several talks that I gave at we used to have something called an MIC class. Do you have MIC? You know what MIC is? Mutual Improvement Class, where, where you, you come with a very small group of brothers. And I gave what I thought was a very fiery exhortation. And, and my grandfather just quietly afterwards said, yeah, that sounded a lot like you've been listening to Brother John Martin recently. <laughs> <laughs> and it was true, I had. And I thought that, that was I was so fired up like Uncle John. But when you're 15, you can't really talk with the same authority that Uncle John can't. And unless you're Uncle John, you can't yell as much as Uncle John does. But we have to have those opportunities and give, give young people and, and even older people, those who are young in the truth, babes in Christ, give them the opportunities, those training grounds where God prepares them for future leadership and future trial. But it's not just the brothers either because there are so many opportunities for, for young ladies to get involved, for young sisters. And the ecclesia needs spiritual leaders 
that are young sisters as well, in the right way, of course. Hopefully, I don't need to clarify what I mean by sisters who are leaders in the ecclesia. There, there are so many things that they can bring in terms of ideas and energy and enthusiasm and, and support. They can, they can be a tremendous asset to different ecclesial committees. God has given opportunity for, for all of us, young and old, male and female, to, to bring these offerings to the ecclesia in the right way, of course, within our roles. And Josiah made that choice at 16. I'm going to start treading along this path. There are some 16-year-olds here this week or 14-year-olds or 18-year-olds. Or what is our, our aspiration, brothers and sisters, for them? What are we doing to contribute to those aspirations? And, and sure, it's great to, to see them that, at that age growing up and, and developing the mind of, you know, that independent mind that says, yes, I want to go get a job and be a, a contributing member of society. And that's good. But, but what are our spiritual aspirations? What are we doing to feed and to help to help guide them in that direction? Because life is a, about a lot more than just traveling around the world and, and having a good enough job that they can they can go to a Bible school. Those are great things. And the fact that you know we come here this week, those are great things, but it's it's got to go beyond that too, doesn't it? It's the things of daily living at home. That's where spiritual groundwork actually takes place. And what are our aspirations for them in five years? Because if Josiah reached 16 and said, okay, I'm going to start seeking God right now on this for one year, I'll devote myself to it and the rest will just be a breeze. That's not how life in the truth works. Is it? It's a consistent pattern, a consistent path that we have to tread along. And we're not just going to hammer on the young people this week just because Josiah was young. We would, we would suggest that Josiah's example goes far deeper than just, well, you know, the record ends most of what it's most of what the record says about Josiah is in his 20th year of life, and then he dies in his 30s. So I'm in my 50s. I'm not, but you might be. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm kind of past these exhortations. That's we know that's not the case with scripture, isn't it? Because these things apply at, at 20 just as much as they apply at 70. I was sitting across the table from a brother and sister a few days ago who were 95 and 91. And they looked me square in the eye and they said, it doesn't get any easier to conquer the flesh. We were reading from the, the readings in Revelation 3 and 4 the other day to him that overcomes. And I wanted to look back and say, please don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I've, I've heard it from other very older brothers and sisters. And those of you who are older than me know that it, it doesn't actually get easier. The mind of the spirit has to get stronger. But these principles apply at every age. You know, the teen years today, um, and those of you who have teens probably can speak to this more than I can, but the teen years have become um, more of a survival period in our society. There, there's less and less expected of teenagers. And I'm sensitive to the fact that over here in this part of the room, I'm not just speaking to you guys, because I'll say the same things to the young people in the other class. But it, it, it's true. There is less and less expected of teens in our society today. The world has accepted the fact that well, teenagers are just, they actually are programmed to be um, irresponsible and, you know, this the type of unreliable character until they turn like maybe 18 or 20 or 22. And I'm not talking about you guys, but that's what the world expects. The world expects very little of teenagers. And it, and it talks as though, you know, there's even a term, maybe you've heard, have you heard of the term adulting? I hadn't heard of this term until a few years ago. It was a, a, a term that was coined about five years ago called adulting. That's, that's the word you use to describe a person who has done something that's more like an adult than a kid. And it's like, well, wait a minute. When did we stop expecting young adults to act, act like adults? It's as though they're just like, this, wow, that was, I, I'm adulting. I'm going to go do something that's a little bit grown up. Congratulations. But that's because the world doesn't expect that of, of young people anymore. And in fact, the age at which it is expected is growing later and later. It keeps getting pushed back. But we can't let ourselves fall into that trap, brothers and sisters. We can't make that bar our bar. There are so many examples, aren't there, of, 
of men and women in scripture seeking God in their youth, not saying, well, once I'm 25, that's when I'll be committed to things. Think of Joseph at 17, Samuel as a very young boy, David as a teenager, Timothy as a young man. We can't fall into the trap of, well, we, we can't expect anything of them. I mean, they're only 13 after all. They're a teenager now. So I guess we just have to be okay with the fact that they'll sleep in till three o'clock in the afternoon and do nothing. Now, guilty. I, I was that 13-year-old and I didn't grow out of it until I was late in my teens. But there's so much more that we can encourage them to do. And there's so much more that God expects of us. Josiah wouldn't have been ready to do at 16 or 20 what he was if he didn't have people encouraging him to develop that mind of the spirit, to, to seek God for all those years. Because by 20 years old, Josiah is ready. God is ready. Because let's face it, Josiah wasn't ready. Which of us feels ready at any point to do some great work in the truth? Most of us don't, but it's in the strength of God that we do so. And he stands up. And he walks into the room, as it were, at 20 years old. Can you imagine this happening in your ecclesia? A 20-year-old comes to a business meeting and says, I have an agenda item I'd like to propose. It's time to do something about the wickedness in this ecclesia. How affronting would that be? And yet, this is the man that God called to do that. And God loves that. God loves that spirit of a person who at any age is prepared to look around at circumstances and say, there are changes that we need to make. This land is filled with idols. You remember the children of Israel were, were 20 years old. Those who were who deemed responsible. God said 20 and up are going to die in the wilderness. How old were the Levites when they entered their service? 20 years old. And, and interestingly, what was the incident that the Levites dedicated themselves to Yahweh in? It was an incident with idolatry. At the same age as, as Josiah begins to purge the land of idolatry, the Le I wonder if he looked back at the Levites and said, well, they were only 20 when God put them into service. And they showed their dedication by, by getting rid of the idols. One brother said that the story of Israel's history is one long battle against idolatry, all the way from, from the time of Jacob and the household idols that Rachel had, all the way up through the Babylonian captivity. Perhaps that's why, brothers and sisters, when Josiah turns 20, he looks at that example and he says, all right, well, the Levites started their work when they were 20, and I'm 20, so it's time to start to get to work. Where are we going to start? We're going to start with the same thing the Levites started with. Where are we going to do it? We're going to do it in Jerusalem, right here at home. Not with other people, not looking around at other people's houses and saying, you need to get rid of that out of your house. That's a bad example for your children. This is an influence you should not have allowed into. He said, no, I'm going to start right here in the home, as it were. And some of these things are things that Israel and Judah, particularly Judah, have struggled with for centuries, generation after generation, through good and bad kings. Because we can become complacent to what influences we allow into our home, can't we? Because it's been like that for a long time. Or because the world environment has changed and I'm stuck in my home. So, well, let's allow some things into our house during COVID that maybe we never would have before. Maybe you didn't have that struggle in your house. But we certainly did. Because there are things that over time you can just allow in as the pressures don't go away. Josiah had to make a stand. He had to acknowledge the fact that even if I stand alone, that one with God is a majority. God is enough. And I'll stand alone if I have to. But he didn't have to, did he? Because God gave him the support network we'll talk about tomorrow. But he did have to make a stand against his family history, against his father, against all the people of Judah who were bowing down, because these are not idols, brothers and sisters, that just sat there unused. These are not things that people weren't doing anything with anymore. He had to stand up and say, for example, we need to get rid of the high places, high places that have been around for, for generations, 
Solomon struggled with these. Jeroboam struggled with these. Rehoboam struggled with these. Asa, Jehoshaphat, Josa, uh, uh, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, Ahaz. Hezekiah comes along and says, right, we're going to get rid of the high places. And what happens after Hezekiah? His son Manasseh rebuilds them again, as it says in 1 Kings 21, verse 3. These are a serious problem for so many people. Many, many faithful men are in that list, brothers and sisters. I don't know about you, but there are times when I sit at home and go, is this really something we should be doing? Well, I, I know a lot of families do and have for a long time, so I guess may, maybe I'm wrong. Can you imagine Josiah being faced with that? He looks around and says, the high places have been here since Solomon. Well, they must not be that bad. No, he, he called a spade a spade and he got to work. He understood, he remembered that God said, there's one place, not many high places, there's one place that I've called to put my name there. The rest need to go. And so that's what he did. It also said, as Brother Chris read, said that he got rid of the groves. Now, we won't go too far into the gro what the groves are. It's, it's the word Asherah. Um, and you remember what the Asherah are. They're, they're either carved out of a log and then stood up in the ground, or they're just, they would find a stump that's already standing up and carve it out of the stump that's already erected there in the ground. And they're symbols of, of horrific things. These are, these are symbols of, of fertility and promiscuity was encouraged in these places. The world we live in with obscene groves everywhere. We, we have grove, we actually have groves in BC. I think you have them here too in Ontario, but they don't grow on trees anymore. They actually grow on long steel stumps. And then at the top, there's something that's like 20 feet by 60 feet. And there's a huge obscene picture on it. Today, some people call it a billboard. They were there in Josiah's day. Or you, you look in the, the, the newspaper or the magazine and how they advertise things. The same obscenity that we see today was there in Josiah's day as well. And the carved and the molten images, things that were made out of wood or metal. Josiah says, we have to get rid of all of it. We have to be prepared to take the steps to remove them, to, to remove the influence that they bring. But it has to go beyond removing, doesn't it? We'll see this as we progress through Josiah's life. Because if we just remove the idols and then don't replace them with anything, then we'll become, like Christ talks about, that, that person who cleans out the house and then seven spirits, even worse, come in. So we're going to talk later in the week about strategies, not just to remove things that need to be removed, but also strategies to replace them. But what did Josiah do with all of this? Because we just have, uh, we finish at 1030, Brother Dan? Okay, so we'll, we'll fly through the last few minutes. Um, it says that Josiah began to purge them from Judah and Jerusalem. And verse 4 tells us how. Josiah knows what to do with an idol, as I think Brother Chris might have said in, in some classes on Josiah years ago. This is a man who knows what to do with an idol. I love that. Because he goes to what we might call extreme effort to make sure that unlike previous times, the result is gonna be different this time. Look at how many times we're told in 2 Chronicles 34, verse four and five, what Josiah did. It says that he break them down, he cut them down, he break them in pieces, he made them dust, he strode it upon the grave and he burnt it. He knew what needed to be done. If you take my special idol that I've made out of wood or stone and you smash it, if you give me enough time, I promise if I like the idol enough, I'll find a way to put it back together. I'll find a glue at the store that is strong enough to put that idol back together. But Josiah went further even than that. He, he ground them to dust. In fact, look at how involved he is in doing this. Who broke down the altar of Balaam in verse 4? It says they did. But where did they do it? They did it in his presence. Josiah doesn't just issue a decree from his throne and say, no, get to work and go off and do it. He's there involved. He's pushing the reboot button on the computer, as it were, because he knows that we need to start over with a fresh start. And he's going to get in there and do it himself, because who cut down the image? Josiah did. 
Who broke in pieces the groves and the carved and the molten images? Josiah did. Who made dust of it all and stored it on the graves? Josiah did. Who burnt the bones of the priests? Josiah did. Now, did he do all of that by himself? Probably not. But the record is careful to show us that this man is involved. This is, this is an enormous effort that he has to go to to show the nation that these gods are as meaningless and powerless as Jeroboam's altar was in 1 Kings 13 that the man of God exposed. And Josiah is involved. It's the same purging zeal that we'll find later in Acts 19 when the believers in Ephesus had to take their books and, and burn their books to, to get rid of that snare. He leaves no stone unturned. As we read there in verse 4, he went way beyond the borders of Judah. Off we go to Manasseh, off we go to Ephraim, to Simeon, even to Naphtali, on the northernmost edge of the region of the land of Israel, including the remote rundown places, as that, um, that phrase at the end of, um, I'm back in First Kings, so I'm still so excited. At the end of, I think it's verse four, is it verse four or five, where it says, with their metics roundabout in the King James? I love that expression. Um, but it, it as, as best we can tell, it, it either is referring to tools that they used or it's referring to ruins, as I think the RSV and some others have it, um, the, with the ruined and the desolate places around the city. Josiah says, we can't afford to leave anything undone because that's the snare that sin is, right? We'll find a way, we'll find a reason, we'll find a good excuse, quote unquote, to pull that thing out of the closet that we just put in the closet rather than getting rid of it. We'll talk a little bit more about um, purging idols in our third class. We're going to leave that for now. But just to conclude, brothers and sisters, what we've looked at has reminded us that it, um, although we, we think of Josiah as this great reformer, I don't know about you, but when you think about Josiah, you think the great reformer purging idols, because that was one of the great works that God had to do for him. It began with preparation because that's where purging begins. Purging begins with preparation. We can't skip that step. We can't expect children to, stick, to skip that step. We can't expect our young people to skip that step because we didn't skip that step. Purging begins with preparation. It's the process of slow and steady development, treading the path day after day. That same well-trodden, well -trodden, non-glamorous path of feasting on God's word, which at times can feel like that manna which our soul loatheth, because that's what the flesh says after enough time. But let it not be so for us, brothers and sisters. Let the preparation continue. And let that preparation be something that we thrill to in our families. At 16 years old, in the shadow of his father's assassination, Josiah had to choose my lineage or my God. You've heard sayings like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. She's a chip off the old block. Often in our lives, brothers and sisters, we are considered a product of our lineage and our environment. I certainly am, am guilty of that in my own case. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm a lot like my dad or people still tell me, oh, you sound like your grandpa when you talk. <laughs> I don't mind because my grandpa was not like Ammon. <laughs> or my dad. But Josiah accepted that age didn't matter. Age didn't matter to God, and seeking God begins in our youth. And isn't that, isn't that the spirit of David? That age doesn't matter. That what God is interested in is the heart. So let's just conclude with um, a couple of wrapping up our, uh, our some what we'll call takeaway points. From our study this morning. The first is that God provides what we need in our youth and at every stage of life, no matter what our circumstances currently might appear to be. A pathway is made by treading frequently. We can't forget that. It's those quiet waters of Shiloh 
as they're referred to in Hezekiah's case. It's that still small voice seeking God as Josiah did. Who is your spiritual role model? Perhaps you've had the same one for many years. Perhaps it's time for a role model shift. Perhaps it's time to choose a spiritual role model. What is our five-year or 10-year plan? At any age of discipleship, it's worth having those, those short and long-term goals, but also for our kids or for our grandkids or for someone else's kids and grandkids in the ecclesia, helping them reach those five and 10-year spiritual goals. And lastly, the purging begins with preparation, because when we seek God, brothers and sisters, he promises that we will, he will, that we will find him. He will be found of us if we seek him with all our heart. And if in the words of our opening hymn, it doesn't use the words good riddance, but sometimes we do just need to bid good riddance to the idol. It, it's a little bit more eloquent with every idol bid us part. Sometimes that seems a little bit almost too simple because the reality is what we need to do is kick the idol out the door and down the street and get rid of it. But we'll talk a little bit more about that on, on Tuesday or Wednesday, God willing. Because we, brothers and sisters, like Josiah, we have a kingdom-driven purpose. God called us to the same purpose that he called Josiah, to glorify him and to manifest his name. And he called us to that and he knew us like Josiah even before we were born.